The child care worker is challenging the state over the use of criminal histories to screen for employment. Because of a new regulation, some workers have allegedly been forced to give up their jobs in child care due to offenses committed while they were juveniles in a class action suit in Suffolk Superior Court. Attorneys say the policy has come down especially hard on workers who are people of color. To tell us about the challenge is one of the pro bono attorneys from the firm Lichten and Liss Reardon. We'd like to welcome Matthew Thompson. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, Matthew. Thank you for having me, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here. Matthew, so far you have one plaintiff in, in this suit. Her name is Tara Gregory. Uh, tell me about her story. Yes, absolutely. So Miss Gregory is a 49-year-old black woman. She lives in Hyde Park. For more than 20 years, she has worked in the child care industry at a local daycare in her neighborhood. She is dedicated to that work, she is passionate about it, and she has proven for the past 20 years that she's qualified to do that work. Um, it was only recently that she received a letter from the state, the Department of Early Education and Care, informing her that based on a criminal background check, she is no longer qualified to do that work and that she had to cease working at all child care locations in the Commonwealth. And this is because of something that happened while uh, Tara Gregory was, what, 16 years old? That's exactly right, yes. So Ms. Gregory was informed by EEC, that's the department in charge here, that she was being banned from working for the rest of her life in the child care industry based on an event when she was 16. She was in a group of girls. They got in a fight. Uh, she was brought into juvenile court and adjudicated delinquent um, for what's called assault and battery with a dangerous weapon, which is a charge based on kicking someone when there's a shoe on your foot. Uh, she served probation for that offense, and the offense was then forgotten. She worked successfully in the child care industry for nearly two decades, and now she's being told she can no longer continue that work. Well, I, I imagine if there's one field where you have to have some kind of almost zero tolerance for any history of violent behavior, it's with you know young children working with them. So uh, isn't this one of those fields? I think this is a field where we have to be very, very cautious about who is working among children. I think that based on Ms. Gregory's 20 years and her employer's uh, strong endorsement, that it's very clear that she is not the type of person who would be a danger to children and that she is, in fact, an exemplary child care employee and the type of people we would be lucky to have working in this industry in the Commonwealth. No, I, I imagine the state would probably want to argue that yeah, it, it, it's, it's very rigid, it's very strict, but this could happen to anybody who has that kind of history. Uh, you're, you're arguing otherwise. Why is that? Uh, we're arguing otherwise um, essentially for two legal reasons, two legal arguments. Um, the first is that Ms. Gregory has a right to due process of law, which is just fundamental fairness, that if she wants to pursue her chosen career in the child care field, and the, and the state seeks to bar her from doing so, they have to do so with at least some rational reason or some fair process involved. Um, the, the second reason that this, that this new policy is so problematic is that it has an obvious disparate impact on people of color, as you mentioned at the beginning. So Ms. Gregory is a black woman. There's an unfortunate history in our country of disparities in the juvenile justice system, people of over-policing in communities of color, over-prosecution at, at quite a disparate rate. Um, so because of those prior issues in her adjudication and the unfairness of the system and the racial disparities in that system, the current policy of barring people from employment based on juvenile adjudications is going to be, uh, fall heavily on, the, on communities of color. Well, I imagine uh, you, you know, one thing that, that I might like to know more about is what, what, what happened when she kicked somebody, supposedly, because you know, there could be a kick that can be brutal and cruel. Other times it can border on self-defense. So, I mean, what about a process for looking into that? Certainly. So I, I think a process of looking into that would be one solution. Right now we have no process for looking into that. So Ms. Gregory has been told by EEC that because they saw a juvenile charge from 33 years ago on a single piece of paper that she could no longer ever work in the field of child care. So actually one of the things that we're asking for in this lawsuit is for that policy to be kicked out as unlawful and unconstitutional. But one solution may be to implement a reasonable process by which we look at people's criminal histories and make an individualized assessment of how long ago was the offense, what was the nature of it, what have you shown of yourself over the past 33 years, and Ms. Gregory has clearly shown that she is capable and qualified to be working in this field. Uh, of course, this suit is a class action suit, so, so at least there's the implication that there are many other people in a certain class who are involved, at least, you know, 
are there any reports out there about other people of color who are being let go and you know and forced to, to stay out of the field? I think those reports are just starting to come out. So this is a relatively new policy. Um, the attorney is working on behalf of Ms. Gregory. We have been contacted by some individuals who are in similar circumstances who have not yet taken any legal action on their own right. Um, and there have been some news reports about other individuals who in very similar situations to Ms. Gregory, a, a Boston Globe article from, I think, February of this year that documented a, a similar individual who was barred because of a, a schoolyard fight, essentially, from 20 years ago and can no longer work in child care. Uh, what about the, the, the argument that this kind of enforcement for, for perhaps a schoolyard incident uh, might be tougher for people of color? I mean, is, is there any pattern out there that, that points in that direction at least? I, th I think what we would look to is there are a significant number of studies from you know, brilliant psychologists and criminologists and sociologists and people of that nature who have looked at this statistically and seen that there are just great racial disparities in how we manage our criminal justice system, particularly historically and particularly in the juvenile justice system, so that um, when you have someone being, or have someone living in a, in a community, it's often a community of color, and the person is engaged in some type of behavior because of over-policing in that community or over-prosecution, they're more likely to become court involved and be adjudicated. I'm wondering if there's also another consequence for, from this policy here because uh, this might not be an easy field to get qualified candidates for. Pay isn't so great, I understand. So uh, right. if you're trying to get people of color to work with children of color, uh, what about that? Yes, I think that that's a very valid concern. I think right now um, there are many daycare centers, including the one where Ms. Gregory was previously employed, that are in communities of color that want to have a diverse workforce and that because of the nature of these jobs being very challenging and often long hours, that it's hard to fill your staff with qualified people. So I think not only is Ms. Gregory being unnecessarily punished by this new policy, but I think you'll find a lot of daycare centers, particularly those operating within communities of color, are going to um, have serious challenges in staffing and, and um, issues related to that. Uh, finally, if there's anybody who'd like to find out more about this, is there a way they can follow up on that, maybe? Yes, absolutely. Um, anyone who's interested in more information could contact my office, Lichten and Liss Reardon, right here in Boston, and um, certainly our co-counsel at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, also here in Boston, could be reached out to. Thank you very much for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you. Matthew Thompson from Lichten and Liss Reardon. We'll have more news in just a moment.